turandursun.com Dinlerden özgürlüğün sesi. Hello. Good. I'd uh, like to welcome you all to Case Western Reserve University. Uh, my name is Patricia Prince House, and uh, this event has sort of evolved on its own. It was originally going to be a debate, but uh, that hasn't worked out, so we are very happy to present a talk by Ken Miller uh, entitled The Collapse of Intelligent Design. Will the next monkey trial be in Ohio? And uh, before we get underway here, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Reverend George Murphy. Uh, if you could come up, uh, he's just going to uh, uh, give us a little uh, blessing here. Do Dr. Uh, Murphy has a PhD in physics and is also a Lutheran minister, and he's a uh, pastoral associate at uh, uh, St. Paul's in Akron. Let us pray. To God, we're gathered here to consider some very important issues about life, about our society, about your role in the world. We pray that we would be guided to have your wisdom and your insight so that we can consider these issues with humility, but also with the knowledge that you want us to seek the truth. Amen. Thank you. I guess I'm next. Um, uh, I want to uh, um, thank uh, Patricia for inviting me here. I want to thank especially Reverend Murphy for that, that wonderful prayer, um, which I was very pleased to join in. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, we live in interesting times, which will be a repeated theme of what I will talk about tonight. Um, I figured I, uh, many of you in the audience are people who know me or have heard me speak before. It's nice to see you again. For those of you who don't know me, I thought I would introduce myself. Um, I'm a cell biologist. I work at Brown University, which is in, in Providence, Rhode Island. I work on the structure and function of biological membranes. Uh, a lot of my work is with the electron microscope, and we try to work on uh, uh, assemblies and channels in biological membranes. That's, in a sense, as a researcher, that's one of my jobs. Another of my jobs is that of a teacher. Um, I'm able to be here today because we're between semesters. My spring classes start on January 26th, and in the fall I teach an upper level course in cell and molecular biology. In the spring I teach a freshman biology course, which is the largest single class at my university. How big is the class? That's not my class. Those are my teaching assistants. Um, <laughs> that will give you some idea as to how big the class is. I also see, I'm very happy to see a large number of young people in the room, and I want to let all of you know, all the young people especially, that. You may already know me, and you may not like me. And the reason for that is if when you were in high school, you used any of these books for high school biology, I wrote them. So I apologize in advance for your experiences or for the backbreaking strain of carrying these guys around in your backpack. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book on evolution and religion called Finding Darwin's God, which I expected to be a nice little book that would be tucked away. Um, on library shelves and pretty much forgotten, although I was sure it would make my mother very proud. Uh, to my absolute astonishment, this book is now in its 23rd printing uh, in paperback and has proven, uh, in the words of my editor at Harper, Harper Collins, to be a bit of a classic on the issue. And if you are interested in issues of evolution and religion, I'd very humbly suggest that you might find the book interesting. The subtitle is The Scientist's Search for Common Ground Between God and Evolution. Very often, when I go out and talk on this issue, I focus on religious aspects. Um, I'd be very happy to answer questions along those lines, but tonight I'm going to focus on the issue of intelligent design, especially as it relates or might relate to Ohio. As I said in the beginning, we live in interesting times. I think one way to think about that is to go back into what is now ancient history. In 1999, the Board of Education of the state of Kansas deleted all mention of evolution from the state science standards. They did that because they regarded evolution either as shaky science or as threatening to the personal beliefs of students uh, and their parents. Uh, what happened afterwards, I think, is, is remarkable. The voters of Kansas had about a year to think about this. Uh, and in the summer of 2000, they voted most of that board out of office. 
and elected a new pro-science majority to the board. Well, as a responsive audience, if you're applauding for that, then you should probably boo for the elections in 2004. Um, and what happened that summer was that an anti-science or anti-evolution majority, majority of six to four, gained control of the Kansas board. Um, and uh, in a little bit, I will show you what they have been doing in the past, years to sci in the past year to science standards in Kansas. Um, I spent almost a week that summer in Kansas actually campaigning for pro-science candidates. I actually expect to do that this summer in Kansas. And the New York Times, when they wrote up this on the front page of the Week in Review, were kind enough to mention me, take a couple quotes from what I talked about, and also mention the title of my book. Um, what happened the next day was remarkable. Whatever you think about people who read the New York Times, they buy books. On Monday morning, a friend of mine called me up and said, have you looked at the bestseller list on Amazon? I said, no, why? He said, just look at it. My book was number 21 on the bestseller list, sandwiched directly between Clancy and Grisham. Uh, it was very exciting. It only lasted 11 or 12 hours, but I enjoyed it very much. Um, and of course, for those of you who are interested, I have very helpfully placed the ISBN number up there on the slide. Um, one of the things that I have found in a history of from time to time, not always, but from time to time going around and debating people on the issue of evolution, which is after all what I expected might take place tonight, um, is that debaters on this issue claim to lead a purely scientific movement. And the pictures you see up here are from a debate in which I participated uh, about three years ago in Columbus in front of the Ohio Board of Education. And the topic at that time was whether intelligent design should be included in the curriculum of Ohio public schools. Now, one of the things that's striking about this is this purely scientific movement attracts an awful lot of support, which is not necessarily scientific. And I want to show you a picture that was taken outside the auditorium in Columbus on the way in. And this gentleman here was in the business of telling me and other people exactly where we would spend eternity if we were foolish enough to take the side of Charles Darwin. It's very clear that this is an issue that arouses very strong and very strongly felt religious feelings. And you might ask yourself, you know, why is that? Um, why, for example, is evolution under attack? Biology is a field that has many disciplines. And if you're going to take one thing out of the biology curriculum, why would you take out evolution? What's special about that? I mean, why not take out cell biology or physiology? Or for God's sakes, why not organic chemistry? Um, <laughs> Um, I can see we have the makings of a popular movement, and I apologize in advance for any chemists who might be in the audience. Um, it's a cheap shot. I realize that. Um, but what's the reason? The reason opponents of evolution will often say is because evolution is very shaky science, and we want to get the science right. But if you go to a website such as Answers in Genesis, which is the leading anti-evolution organization in the United States, you'll find a very different set of reasons. And I invite you to take a look at this graphic. Evolution is depicted as the foundation of lawlessness, homosexuality, pornography, and abortion. Not just that it's wrong, but it is the source of all of these bad things, whereas creationism is the source of a lot of good things. Now, if this is not graphic enough for you, I've got another one that I think will help. And this is also from Answers in Genesis, and I show this not because I want to make fun of it, but because I want to make a deadly serious point. And I like to show this to academic audiences, because academic audiences often think this really is an argue about sci argument about science. And they say, how about if we did this experiment? How about if we showed them this fossil? How about if we did this in the laboratory? Would that convince them? Well, take a look at this. If you regard evolution as the foundation of divorce, pornography, abortion, racism, and all this other bad stuff. Whether it's right or not, in the scientific sense, doesn't matter. Because it is the source of everything that is wrong and evil in society. And what I love about this is the founder of evolution, I can't read that name here, I'm sure you can, but it's not Darwin, um, it's somebody else. And if you portray, if you view evolution in this respect, of course you're going to oppose it, you're going to oppose it deeply. So how do you answer? How does science respond? I think there are a lot of ways to respond, and one way is to develop a proper understanding of science. Some of you may know that about four years ago, a county in Georgia thought that the new biology books they had bought for their students were so dangerous 
in terms of their treatment of evolution that they needed warning stickers